<laughs> so, as I mentioned in my review of the previous season, I was a big fan of the first season of The Wire. This police drama, novel for the way it depicts drug gangs and the cops out to get them simultaneously, was gritty, it felt realistic, and it had great entertaining characters. I had heard quite a few things about the second season, namely that it is a bit of an oddball in the run of the show for being drastically different from the first. I do wonder if that reputation has come about because during the initial run of the show, I can see how the second season seems like you're watching a completely different show, but in retrospect, looking back at the entire show, each season focuses on a different aspect of the city of Baltimore so I wonder if it's a case of the second season doing the same thing that the rest of them did only it did it first so people were more shocked I still haven't seen the rest of the Y so what do I know in any case, season 2 is a big shock because there seems to have been a huge shift in characters and plots the Barksdale crew, the primary targets of the cops in season 1, are relegated to being one of the season's B-plots. They're almost completely sidelined, though there is clear promise that these guys are going to return in big fashion in future seasons. It's so different from season 1 that Michael K. Williams, who played Omar, who again is hardly in this season, said that he was angry and went to the show's creator, David Simon, accusing him of essentially giving a show made great by black storylines to white guys. I have to say though, as someone who preferred the gangs and raids of season 1 to the storyline of season 2, it does give the show a more realistic feel to have prominent characters drop in and out of importance during the course of the show's run. For the same bunch of characters to always be front and centre would make The Wire start to feel like a lesser show. Our boy Jimmy McNulty is reassigned by his hateful boss Rawls to the Marine unit, and as Rawls knows this was the one unit McNulty would most hate working in. And as you watch this depressed and dejected alcoholic bob up and down a police boat, fishing rod in one hand and the onset of frostbite approaching in the other, it's bizarre knowing this is the same fiery frenzied maverick from the first season who was the heart and soul of the Barksdale operation though I suppose we'd all be similarly moody if we were in his position. And it was hilarious seeing McNulty painstakingly do more work than he's ever done in his life, making a case to pin a body of a dead woman found in the water in Rawls' jurisdiction. And he later does something similar when a set of 13 dead women are found in a shipping container on the Baltimore docks. Rawls is naturally furious as 14 murders with practically zero chance of the murders being solved would ruin homicide's clearance rate. And it was interesting seeing the dynamic and politics with regards to ownership of cases. There was a scene, for example, where the heads of different departments, Rawls included, are in a meeting furiously playing oral badminton, trying to land the murder cases on each other. And as a layman with practically no experience with the law, it's both sad and hilarious to see these guys giving so much attention to trying to avoid the murder cases, much like how you and I would try and get out of our managers trying to dump more work on our desk. But that's what the why is all about, isn't it? The systems, policing ones included, warts and all. The main shift in storyline in season 2 is that the focus of the season is on the Baltimore docks, not drug dealers and gangsters in the projects. And in doing so, the show introduces a whole new bunch of characters, all shoved in your face before you can tell who's who, aside from one guy, Ziggy, a guy with a big ego and an even bigger dick, literally, who's the kind of guy that wouldn't be able to pour water out of a shoe if the instructions were written on the heel, and he fancies himself something of a gangster. He's the son of Frank Sobotka, the union treasurer, a highly complex and well-developed character who does what needs to be done for his union and takes care of his crowd. But he is involved with, shall we say, skimming off the top when it comes to the content of shipping containers coming into the docks. And a deal he is in with, uh, an elusive figure known as the Greek, threatens to burst into something huge and dangerous for all. Sobotka's idiot son has a cousin Nick, a much more level-headed guy, but one as equally if not more involved with the enigmatic European gangsters than his uncle. Unlike Ziggy, whose intentions are related to ostentation, Nick needs money to build a life for himself, to find a house for his woman and himself, and he isn't getting the money he needs on the docks, because working hours always go to seniority and Frank is fighting a losing battle to keep his world alive. Increased automation and other issues are cropping up, and he needs to raise funds to lobby a congressman to fund a new canal, which ultimately means more jobs for the union men. 
In fact, the entire main storyline of season 2 comes from Frank Sabotka donating an expensive stained glass window to a church, which pisses off Major Valchek because he wanted the spot that Sabotka got. Feeling slighted, Valchek heals his wounded ego by literally creating an entire cop detail just to go after Sabotka, who he's convinced is dirty because he thinks he has too much money. At first, the detail is run by a bunch of nobodies, but then an initially reluctant Lieutenant Daniels, who almost retired from the force completely and went into law, is brought in to run the detail. And he in turn picks his crew, which just happens to be more or less all of our favourite characters from the first season that were in his detail. People like McNulty, Herc and Kima. And so our heroes reunite, Avengers style, to take down a Union treasurer, all because of a Major's bruised ego. It reminds me of The Sopranos, where almost an entire season of conflict and betrayal and violence all came because one person made a fat joke about another man's wife. But in typical Wire fashion, the dead woman found in the water, the 13 girls, the docks, the Greek, the Union, it is all connected, it all comes together. Even the streets from the first season, as it's more or less revealed that some of the best drugs that Proposition Joe gets, who's a competitor of the Barksdale crew, is from the Greek. So in a way, it's like season one is about drugs on a street level, and season two is about where those drugs come from, with us peeking momentarily at gangsters who operate on an international level, with people as far up as the FBI in their pocket. The ongoings with the Barksdale crew were interesting, even though they didn't feature much. D'Angelo took a 20-something year sentence at the end of the first season, and though he and Avon are behind bars together, D'Angelo is not seemingly with it. He's cold, distant, doesn't talk much with his mother, with Avon, and just seems to want out, to be away from it all and to be away from everyone. In spite of Avon and his crew concocting a quite frankly criminal mastermind worthy plan to get D'Angelo a reduced sentence, he's as indifferent as ever, and his behaviour leads the likes of Stringer Bell to question his loyalty, thinking he may flip as he was going to at the end of the last season. This leads to, spoiler alert, Stringer, unbeknownst to anyone, even Avon, sanctioning D'Angelo's death in prison, with another inmate doing the deed and making it look like a suicide. That was a very sad part of the season, one of two really sad deaths. And what with D'Angelo's development, I really thought this was a character who was going to last many seasons, possibly even the whole show, with a long, great arc. So you can imagine my shock when he basically got Michael B. jordan over the course of the season, especially during Stringer's visits to Avon in prison, you can kind of see that he's manoeuvring all the chess pieces required in order to assert more power for himself and move himself into a position where he's making decisions behind Avon's back. It's going to be interesting seeing where all this is going. And to be honest, I actually saw it coming even in season one because, well, not because of anything that happens in the show itself, but really because whenever you see promos and adverts of The Wire, they always showcase Idris Elba and not the guy who played Avon. So when Avon was the main target in season one, I figured that either Avon gets put away for a long time or he gets violently bumped off and the number two, Stringer, eventually takes his place. And it seems as though that is in the process of happening. One thing that really needs to be commented on is the nuance of The Wire. So many things are so subtle, so blink and you'll miss it, that you sometimes wonder if they're even there at all and half wish The Wire would cater to you and make things a little more obvious, linger on shots a little longer, just to emphasise a point so you can be sure it was actually being made in the first place. Let me give an example. The legal system liaison of the detail, Rhonda Perlman, who McNulty has an on-off fuck buddy relationship with, is standing next to McNulty as he types in a report of a raid of an illegal brothel, a raid in which he made the sacrifice of getting a bit of hanky-panky with two of the hookers. The whole thing is kind of played for laughs, but if you look at Rhonda's face as she reads the report, she looks absolutely horrified and distraught, mortified, and she walks away without a word. Easy to miss if you were still focusing on tee-hee-hee-hee, Jimmy slept with the hookers, but a fine little detail. Another great example of the show's subtlety is Daniel's wife. She makes her feelings clear that Daniel's, after being given a shit post after the events of season one, should retire and go into law. When he is seduced by the detail, she is obviously angry, as shown by one scene where her and uh, Daniel's eat their supper and she's got her grumpy face on. But she kind of disappears from the show after that, but makes a brief appearance later on when a call comes for Daniel's late in the night. 
She passes the phone to him, and without waiting to see who would be calling at this hour or what it must be about, surely it's urgent, walks back into her room, closes the door and turns her light off. That, and the fact that the duo were clearly sleeping in different rooms, tells you everything you need to know about what has happened to their relationship since Daniels agreed to lead the detail. Fantastic visual storytelling. Season 2 takes an interesting look at the working man's life on the ports of Baltimore and the struggles they face and the decisions they make to get into bed with criminals. Unlike many of the high-level thugs in season 1 like Stringer and Avon, crime for guys like Frank Sobotka isn't a desired way of life but it's a necessary means to an end because that's how the game is played. Heck, this guy had an entire detail on his ass simply because he got on the wrong side of a guy high up in the police force. There's a whiff of Greek tragedy in season 2. You see individuals go through a lot who are in deep with sunk cost fallacy in full swing, and if these characters expect their hard work to yield results, well, maybe they just didn't catch the first season of The Wire. Guys like Ziggy are annoying, but intentionally so. In fact, his story does actually go somewhere interesting. The only real disappointment of a character is... Brother Malzone, a supposedly incredibly deadly hitter who is hired by Avon to stop encroachment of rivals on his turf. Malzone talks and looks like a school prefect, and he has quirky lines like, the most dangerous thing in America is a nigger with a library card, but he feels like a bit of a contrived character, a cartoon that has stumbled onto the set of a gritty urban crime show. I did find him amusing, like how calm he was and diplomatic he was after he got shot, but he felt like the showrunners wanted to insert a colourful wildcard character into the season, as they did Omar in the first, but it didn't quite work. Also, while we're talking about negatives, it did feel a little contrived how the gang from season 1, who were all realistically assigned to different departments and cases, were all brought back together for a new detail. And it does make you kind of think, you know, what was the point in separating them in the first place and taking about three or four episodes to bring them together? One of the more bleaker and darkly comic elements of season two, and this does feel like a far more bleaker season than the previous, is that after the case is done, and some people have died, others have gone to prison, and some have escaped the long arm of the law, after all the issues with the dead girls in the container, we see a shot of more women being unloaded out of a container. The case was solved, but the problem and the system continues. In fact, there is a montage towards the end, quite a goosebump-inducing scene, highlighting the state of each character's life, with one shot of a central character clinging onto a fence, staring out at the dying docks, clinging as if he is in a prison cage, stuck in a never-ending limbo. In general, season 2 of The Wire is at a similar level as season 1, in terms of the quality of the writing and acting, but for me personally, the first season is superior, simply because the characters it dealt with were just more interesting for me. I did enjoy the Sabotka storyline, very much so, even if it did have a slow start, but there is an element of me where I'm thinking, okay, you've scratched that itch now, so can we go back to the gangs and the streets? And so, let's see what season 3 has in store.